Matthew chapter 11, verse 3 to 6. The title of my message today is When God is Silent. Matthew 11, 3 to 6. And as you turn there, as we start to look at this, as we dive into this series, let me give you a little context to the passage. It's an important passage. And one of the things I always tell you is you need to understand the context of the passage you're reading in the Bible. And nowadays, by the way, because you don't even need, you know, before pastors had big concordances and big books with information, nowadays all this information is available on Google. Google is your friend, as they said. Wikipedia has all this information. So when you're reading the book of John, when you're reading whatever book you're reading, you, you can actually go and find out more about the person you read about. Are they a historical figure? What is told about them uh, out, out there? And you can get some context that helps you understand the stories in Scripture. So I'll give you a little context for this story. This story begins with Herod the Great. Herod the Great was the king of Palestine imposed by the Romans in the early life of Jesus, in the first very few years of Jesus' life. Herod wasn't called the Great because he was a great guy. <laughs> On the contrary. The reason he was called the Great is because of some of the huge developments that he did. He was a phenomenal builder. And he did huge constructions. He built buildings and aqueducts and many other things. I've had the privilege of seeing some of the things he put up. They're still, to, they're still useful today. And you'd be shocked because this is a couple of thousand years later. He was a phenomenal builder. But Herod was a terrible man. He was an awful guy. I mean, this guy, <laughs> he married se several wives, killed at least two of them that are known, killed his own children, at least two children that are known. And who does this? He killed one of his mothers-in-law. I mean, who kills their mother-in-law? <laughs> okay, some of you are looking at me suspiciously, but <laughs> I mean, this guy was horrible. I mean, you read the Bible and you read the story of Jesus' birth. This is the same Herod who was so insecure that when he heard from prophecy that a king was going to be born, a young boy who would become a king one day, and he had been born in Bethlehem, what did he do? He sent his soldiers and they killed all the boys below two years old in Bethlehem. This was a ruthless, bloodthirsty leader. He's so terrible that history tells us that when the time came for him to die, that he was so angry that he was dying, that he rounded up all the leading citizens of his kingdom. All of them were rounded up in one city called Jericho. And he gave the order, the minute I die, kill all of them. He said, why should it be my family only that's mourning? Let everybody mourn. I mean, this guy, he was something else. Now, fortunately, what happened is when he died, the people he gave the order changed the order. So what happened, actually, what he didn't want happened, what he didn't want is what happened, because when he died, everybody's life was spared, and there was a big party. So it's like people celebrated when he died, the opposite of what he wanted. But he was a terrible guy. So anyway, he dies, and the Romans came, the people who were really in charge, they came, and they took his kingdom. Caesar Augustus was the emperor of Rome at that time. He split the kingdom into two, Palestine into two, he gave the lower part of the kingdom to one of his sons, Herod's sons, called Achilles. And then the northern part, he split that into two other parts. And he gave one part to, Her to Antipas, one of the sons called Antipas, and another son called Philip. Now, the soap opera begins then. By the way, do you know the Bible has more drama than a soap opera? Uh, because the soap opera begins right after that. I mean, this guy called uh, Philip, he marries his niece. I mean, their niece, because they are three, they are, they are three brothers, marries their niece, who is a very, very beautiful woman. Her name is Herodias. And so he marries Herodias. They have a daughter, a very beautiful daughter, called Salome. And then guess what? His brother, uh, Antipas, lives on, the, on this other side, comes to visit. He's on the western side, comes to visit him. And when he comes to visit, he brings gifts. He lives with a wife. Because what he does, he sees his brother's wife, falls in love with her, and elopes with her. How's that for drama? I mean, he steals his brother's wife. And not only the wife, he takes the daughter as well. So Salome goes with the mom. And this guy goes home with a bride. He leaves his brother broken, divorced, and he comes home with a wife. And this is the kind of drama the Herods had. Now, everything seems to be going well for her, for Herodias, and for her new husband, Antipas. But for one thing, and this is the next character in our story, his name is John the Baptist. He's actually the main character of our story today. John the Baptist was a special kind of guy. He was a fearless influencer. He was a kind of guy who did not fear anyone. And as a result, John had become very popular with the regular people. 
Because even power did not intimidate him. When he saw somebody who was to at the top doing the wrong thing, John spoke out. He was an activist. And so John saw this thing. He knew it was sinful. He knew it was wrong. And he began to preach against it. And at that point, as he was doing his duty, speaking against what he should have been speaking against, Herodias was so angry, the wife, that she told her husband, you must arrest this guy or kill him. The Bible tells us, because the Bible has this story, and you can read it for yourself, the Bible tells us that Herod was not into killing John because he feared the people liked John, but he also knew John was a holy man. And so he did his best to protect John, but eventually he had to listen to his wife, and he arrested John and put him in jail. So here John was doing the right thing, and now he was in jail, and Herodias was convinced that she was going to... John saw this thing, he knew it was sinful, he knew it was wrong, and he began to preach against it. Herodias was so angry, the wife, that she told her husband, you must arrest this guy or kill him. The Bible tells us, because the Bible has this story, and you can read it for yourself, the Bible tells us that Herod was not into killing John, because he feared the people liked John, but he also knew John was a holy man. And so he did his best to protect John, but eventually he had to listen to his wife. And he arrested John and put him in jail. So here John was doing the right thing, and now he was in jail, and Herodias was convinced that she was going to kill him, do everything she could to kill him. So, so, so even at this point, think about it. You're in that situation. Some of you found yourself in that situation where you're doing the right thing, you're trying to honor God, you're trying to carry out your calling, that's what John was doing, and then boom, the guy is in prison. So here is a place then that we get to our story. John is in prison, in a place where he needs divine intervention, has been faithful to God, now he's in trouble, calling out for, to God for help, and God does exactly nothing. In his prison cell, John can hear what Jesus is doing. Jesus is going around healing people. Jesus is going around setting people from de free from demons. Jesus is going around doing all kinds of things for other people. But nothing for the one man who came to prepare the way for him. This was what John's mission was. John prepared the way for Jesus. John preached about Jesus. John made the way clear for Jesus so people could accept Jesus. And he's not doing anything for him. To make things worse, John is Jesus' cousin. And at that point in prison, understandably so, John begins to doubt. And John calls some of his friends together. Some friends have come to visit him in prison, some of his disciples. And he says, I want you to go to Jesus, and I want you to ask him this question. So let's read from Matthew chapter 11. That's a context for our story. Matthew chapter 11, verse 2, and we're going to read till verse 6. I'll make a few, a few interjections in the middle. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Now, now, let me pause a minute. Because I think at that point, John's disciples probably paused in the story and said, wait a minute. Are you sure you want us to ask that question? Some of you at the beginning of this message, you said, I had a, I've had a fantastic year. I've had an incredible year. My business is going well. My relationship is going well. I got married this year. Things are happening for me. And you know, most of the time when that's, our, when that's our story, when that's your testimony, for most of us, we're like, God is with me. God loves me. I'm walking with God. God I have favor with God. There are some of you who say today, I've had the hardest year of my life. And many times when we're in that situation, what do we think? We think, I feel like God has left me. I feel like God no longer cares. I feel like God doesn't hear my prayers nowadays. I feel like God has just sort of left me and moved on to other things. You see, God didn't change, but our circumstances changed. And when our circumstances changed, our view of God changes. And that's where John is. He's saying, are you the one? Are you the one who was to come? And you know, God hasn't changed. God hasn't become different. But for John, it almost seems like God has shrunk down to the walls, the size of the walls of his cell. God has become small because of John's situation. So here is Jesus' answer. And by the way, let me say this. Jesus' answer is extremely important for us. Why? Because I believe he's, it's a word for every single one of us who has ever found ourselves in this situation or will find ourselves in this situation in the future. Jesus says, 
Jesus replied to John the Baptist. Verse 4. Go back and report to John what you hear and see. In other words, he's saying, because John can't see beyond the walls of his prison cells. Because God's John, uh, John's God has shrunk to the size of his prison cell. Go and tell John what God is doing outside the prison cell. He says there are things, big things that God is doing. Go and report these things to John. And he says, verse 5, the blind receive sight, the lame are walking, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. He says, go and tell John these things. And then he says, finally, the one other thing you want to tell him is blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of of me. Now, I kind of suspect this was not the answer John was expecting. I think that John was probably expecting when he sends the disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one? That Jesus will say, go tell John, I'm the one and I'm coming to break him out of prison. That's probably what he was expecting, a prison break, isn't it? I even suspect that, by the way, that question, are you the one, was not really a question. It was an expectation. And then he says, finally, the one other thing you want to tell him is blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Now, I kind of suspect this was not the answer John was expecting. I think that John was probably expecting when he sends the disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one? That Jesus will say, go tell John, I'm the one and I'm coming to break him out of prison. That's probably what he was expecting, a prison break, isn't it? I even suspect that, by the way, that question, are you the one, was not really a question. It was an expectation. That John was really saying to Jesus, if you are the one, while you are out there saving the whole world, while you are out there helping everybody else, I am still here. By the way, have you ever prayed a prayer like that? God, while you are there saving all the children of Bosnia, and you are holding up the, the nations of the world, I'm still here. My situation hasn't changed. I'm your servant. Look at me. And this is what John seems to be telling Jesus. Here's where I am. But the interesting thing for me is what Jesus then replies. Because Jesus doesn't reply the way John is expecting. What does Jesus, what does Jesus do? He points John to what God is doing outside the prison cell. And he's basically saying, your mission was to prepare the way for Jesus, was to prepare the way for me. Now look at what God is doing through me. Look at the great things that God is doing. Your mission is still there. Your purpose hasn't changed, even though your circumstances may not seem to be working. God's plan for you is still intact. God hasn't forgotten you. It's still important what you came to do. And I sense that God, Jesus is telling him, look beyond your prison cells, because God is much greater than your circumstances. And there's a very important thing that God asks him here. I really believe, by the way, when I read this, huh, I saw a question here in this text that I believe is God's question to many of us today. <laughs> Not just those who are going through a difficult time, but for every single one of us who claims to follow God or who wants to follow God. And this is a question. Will you trust God's plan or will you make a God to fit your plans? I think that's what God is really asking, John. <laughs> will you trust God's plan, even though you don't understand it? Will you trust God's plan? Or will you make your own God? Will you make a God to fit your plan? I'm going to explain what that means. You see, the problem is it's very unfortunate that when we face a difficult situation, we shrink God to the size of our situation. We shrink God to the size of our prison cell. Like John the Baptist, all we can see are the four walls of our cell. All we can see are the, the things that constrain us. And we begin to put God in that situation. We see him as small as the walls of our cell. And we begin to reach certain conclusions. My goodness, maybe God has abandoned me. Maybe God doesn't care. Maybe God doesn't exist. But you know what God tells John? God says, look at the big picture. My purpose is still being carried out. You're part of that purpose, and your purpose is still valid. God still cares for you. God has not forgotten you. Even though your situation 
is not working out the way you want. And the question he's asking is, will you trust God's plan or will you make a God to fit your plans? You know, this is a truth that many of us don't want to hear. We don't like to hear this truth. To be honest, I don't like to hear it. I'd rather have a God who comes through when he's supposed to come through on cue. You know what I'm talking about? You pray a certain way, you wait a certain time, but you know he's going to come through. I'd, I'd rather have that. I'd rather have a God who sort of fits a certain pattern, a predictable God. That's one of the things I, I, I don't like about this truth because I, I prefer God to be predictable, to fit into what I want him to be. But you know, the interesting thing is that God is sovereign. And what this word means is that he's in charge. And God's sovereignty means that he can dictate the circumstances to fit my desires. He can. Because of my desires, he can dictate the circumstances to fit my desires. But there are times when he can overrule my desires to create other circumstances. That's what a God, a real God does. And for God to be God, then he has to have the authority to dictate how things turn out. You know, one of the things that he asks John is, will you let your faith stumble? Will you let your faith stumble because things aren't working the way you think they should be working? Now, I just sense I need to say something about this. You know, the church today, and we pastors, I think sometimes we fail you as God's people because of the way we teach about Christianity. I think we teach a Christianity that's not very biblical. We teach a Christianity that is almost, I'd say today there's almost like a spiritual Christianized witchcraft that is taught by the church. You know why I say that? Because witchcraft, you know how witchcraft works, isn't it? You carry out a certain prescribed set of actions and you get a certain prescribed result. Isn't that witchcraft? Stop looking at me like you don't know what a witch doctor does. Isn't that what witch doctors do? You go, you take certain entrails, you wrap them around your waist, you have an amulet, you put it on, and what happens? All evil spirits, they go. It's guaranteed. You do this action, you get that reaction. That's how witchcraft works. And many times pastors have taught people a Christianity that is almost a divine, a spiritualized kind of witchcraft, a Christianized witchcraft. Where we're saying, you know, pray this way. Pray this way, and this result will happen. Do this thing in this way. Fast in this way. Give your tithe envelope in this way. Send this number to the Mpesa. And what will happen? All your situations will change. Because why? God will be constrained to act because of that action. It's almost like a God of our own creation. You know, we have an interesting anthem. Our, anthem, our national anthem says, Oh God of all creation. But I think many times Christians, we serve the God of our creation. Oh God of my creation. God who I've made to do what I want. When I press the button, he always comes through. This is a kind of God that sometimes we've taught in the church. We make a God who fits our plans. But you know, it's such an easy thing to have an event-based faith. It's so easy to serve God when things work out the way I want. But I sense that Jesus sends John a hard answer. He doesn't send him an, uh, an answer that I find comforting. He doesn't send him an answer that I find easy or even <laughs> one that I receive easily sometimes with joy. He tells him, will you, will you trust God's plan or will you make a God to fit your plans? That's what God is asking today. Now, it's very interesting because Jesus sends John, his disciples back to John and he says, tell John what you see. Tell him what you hear. Tell him what's going on around outside his prison. And I sense that for some of us who are in that difficult situation, by the way, as I speak this message, some of you are in that difficult, challenging situation looking for answers. And I sense that Jesus' question or question back to you would be to, the same as he gave to John. He said, look outside your prison cell. Look outside your circumstances. Look what God has done. Look what God is doing. He's the same God who was there when you called him as a teenager. He's the same God who saved you from being wayward. He's the same God who helped you in your exams. He's the same God who gave you that job. 
He's the same God who you called and he helped you. He's the same God who saved you in the past. And just because your circumstances are different today doesn't mean that God has changed. God is still on the throne. And he's not a God of your creation. He's a God of heaven and earth. And if you want to serve the God of heaven and earth, you then need to say, do I trust that he has the right to order circumstances the way he chooses to order them? Will you trust God's plan? Or will you make a God to fit your plans? God may be silent, but he's never absent. God may be silent right now, but he's never absent. And you need to decide, did I sign up to follow a real God? Or did I sign up to, sign up to, to follow a God who I can control? Who does things the way I want to do them? This is a hard truth that I sense God shares to John. Now, I wanted to start with a simpler message. I wanted to start with something a little lighter. I wanted to start with something that would bring a little more joy and smiles that I'm seeing right now. I wanted to start with something that would make you jump up and say, Hallelujah, God is going to come through and go with your faith strengthened. But I just sense that God is leading us to a season when we must really have a faith that is based on God and not on our own desires. And that we must move away from a faith that is a, a, a childish faith. You know, childish faith is that faith that is almost like your, they call them rice Christians. As long as God keeps the rice flowing, I'll keep following. And God is saying, this is not the season for that. I'm looking for sons and daughters who will follow me regardless. I'm looking for sons and daughters who will trust me and choose to trust me, even though the situation doesn't change. I'm looking for sons and daughters like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who says we will follow God, we will honor God, regardless of whether we're thrown in the fire or not. Even if God doesn't save us, still we will serve him. I sense that this is what God is looking for. And he's saying, if you want to follow your own kind of God of your creation, who does your bidding, that's not the God of the Bible. But the question God is asking us today Will you trust God's plan or will you make a God who fits your plan? There's a great song by a man named Donnie McClacken. And it says simply that word, I choose to trust you, Lord. I want us to listen to the words of this song. And as the singers sing this song for us, I want us to actually get into a space where we think through. I want you to actually hold the situations in your mind where you've been disappointed by God. Hold those situations in your mind that are not working out the way you've wanted them to work out. If it's an errant child, if it's a habit that you've struggled with, if it's a situation, a marital situation that is not working out, if it's a financial situation that you've had difficulty, whatever place you felt disappointed because God hasn't come through as you expected, I want us to hold on to that. If you could, could you just mentally hold that? Just picture that. Is that okay? Can you picture it? Are you awake? Tell your neighbor, he's talking to you. So just picture that situation, that thing that it is that you're holding on to. Just begin to picture it right now. I want you to just put that situation, make these your words, because I sense this is where God is starting us off as we begin this series. 